Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Virtual Engagement Ideas Summit. Our very special guest today is Preacher Moss, all the way from Washington, D.C. He went to college at Marquette University in Wisconsin, and now he is a, gosh, a podcast host, a poet, a comedian, uh, uh, just a great all-around guy. I met Preacher a long time ago uh, and have seen you on stage, I don't know how many times, always always good for a laugh because um, you're very funny. Um, but I want to talk to you about your first teaching job right out of college. You taught the class that nobody wanted to teach. How did you connect with those kids? Um, well, I had to fail first. Um, the children that I was teaching were severely most disturbed kids. Uh, in spe- it wasn't special ed in Wisconsin. It was called exceptional ed. Uh-huh. Special education. And uh, I came in and kind of introduced myself like, I'm going to be your educational messiah. Uh, please sit down and let me bask in my glow. And um, I remember having on this really, really white shirt with a black tie. And uh, I thought I was, I thought I was, I thought I was the bomb, you know, and a kid goes, look like we got a freedom rider for a teacher. And uh, <laughs> I was like, this is not going to go well. Yeah. What happened was <clears throat> I came with such a different type of expectation for the kids, not understanding that they dealt with a high level of failure. Um, and it, the failure of the system, failure is not to be able to recognize what the needs are. Um, and until that happened, I didn't understand that in many regards, I am these kids. In many regards, we have the same hopes and, and ideas and aspirations, if you will. And it was a humbling. So it's almost like you failed, but no, it's like the kids made you humble. Mm-hmm. And it brought it down to understanding them at the, you know, the lowest common denominator of how they exist, which is actually very high. Mm-hmm. But as a teacher, you're, you're, you're on this plateau. And it was interesting because uh, you have to let the children teach you how to teach them. And so I thought that was an amazing process. And that really marked what I did moving forward uh, all the way from, and especially even in stand-up, learning how to uh, take some time to understand how the audience laughs in order to educate them on these things that are around. So every day is almost like going to class. So going to school or <clears throat> going to a college was almost like going to class every day. Just didn't have those little faces uh, calling you freedom rider in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, you feel like you, you went in with a sort of sense of expectation for yourself and an, an energy and an I can do everything attitude, like graduating from college or doing being a student teacher and then the reality of working with them. Um, well, actually, you know, when I graduated college, I actually went uh, back to D.C. from Marquette. Uh-huh. I worked in uh, juvenile correction, uh, social services, and uh, outreach for about three years. And then I went to Milwaukee to uh, to teach. <clears throat> and what was interesting was I took those expectations of working with kids that were at risk. My philosophy was maybe if I catch a kid younger, we'll have a better level of a success, a better rate of success. Yeah. And what you find is there's a, there's, there's a lot of hurt. And there's a lot of uh, trauma at all levels when you're dealing with kids. And not just inner city kids. I mean, you, you work in some spaces, you know, things happen in the suburbs that happen in the inner city. You know, it's just responded to differently. But the kids, you know, the kids helped me understand how to be an effective human being when I was in front of them. And uh, I think the first thing I learned from my teachers and one of one of my teacher mentors yeah. saw me just getting killed for the first month and a half. And she literally said, your problem with the kids is you're, you're trying to play by the school rules. They know the school rules, yeah. school up your game. And I remember I took that to heart. And so I had a kid acting up one time and my, and my philosophy, my concept was, I wonder if he acts that way when he's at home. So I actually scheduled a home visit. <laughs> so I let him act up in class that day. I didn't say anything, but he didn't know I was coming to his house that afternoon. Oh, man. <laughs> and uh, he was like, what's up, Ms. Moss? You, I, no, go ahead, do what you got to do. Throw the chair down. I'm good. 
man, I tell you, Jason, when he knocked on the door, his mother told him to answer the door. He opened the door and it was me. He turned on. And he was pale as pale could be. <laughs> In fact, he steps out of the he stepped out of the uh out of the apartment. He's like, we need to just have a little talk <laughs> before you go in. Oh, really? A couple of things. I'm like, oh no, we good. And I, t- I sung on him like a uh, Takashi Six Nine, brother. <laughs> I, yeah, 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 yeah. I snitched him out. But what was interesting is his mother said something. His mother said, "This is the first teacher that ever came to your house uh, in regards to you." Mm-hmm. And I realized that it wasn't my first time I had been doing it with social services. Yeah. My orientation with all the OGs, that's what we did. You checked on them. Yeah. So it was it was interesting, man. So it was a very uh personally uh engaging yeah. uh, conversation I had with the mothers, very robust. And you begin to understand what the problems are, what the issues are. Uh, you know, you can't you can't yell from across the street. You gotta go across the street and find out what's going on. And after that, man, it was funny because all the other kids started acting better. Uh, not because I was a great teacher, but they lived in fear of me showing up to their house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's really it's really a, a sort of a neat example of making a genuine connection yes. with somebody who you're trying to help and teach and connect with their family. And, you know, ha- has that impacted the way that you look at even your audiences? I mean, because you started as a teacher, you looked at your, your classroom as folks you were trying to help. And even in your comedy, when you're walking on stage, you're you're still teaching. Everything you do is, I is agree. teaching. Yeah, you're you're go ahead. You know what's interesting is um there used to be a lot of comics like what I do. Yeah. And what we were was we, we were conversationalists. We could have a conversation. Uh if you watch prior, you watch George Carlin. That was the skill set. Like we can have a conversation. Like um, you're a musician. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my favorite musicians is Al Jarreau, uh, jazz guy. Love Al Jarreau. But when he would ever come to Milwaukee to perform, the show should have been his show should have been like an hour, fifteen minutes. His show would be like two hours twenty minutes. Yeah. Because every song he see somebody in the audience and he have a conversation. He'd be singing, but hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Joe, is that you, but Joe, man? How's your mama for? I, you know, and I'm like this. Are you gonna get back to singing? I realized the audience loved that with him. Right. That's why he would come. That's why he support him. But you know, the, the art of conversation, particularly talking about difficult things, is you know, it's something that's that's just, it's a bit uh, a fleeting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not taught as much. The nuance isn't there a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So, and even in public education, colleges, things are very. Um, established to be very, very pragmatic and segmented, mm-hmm. that there's not an organic mix a lot of times. Um, I saw a video this morning on Instagram, and it had a guy who was holding a Black Lives Matter sign, but the guy was white. And he left his camera there, and I mean, they said some of the most racist stuff to him. It was down south. I mean, they said it to him. I mean. Oh. Other, other, yeah, after you, white lives matter too. I mean, I was like, whoa, <clears throat> and, and then people threatened the guy. He was, and he was white. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, you start talking about because we talk about s- systemic racism. Da da. What you're really talking about, man, is people who are living with high amounts of pain that has been unresolved. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, and it was painful to watch. Right. I literally had empathy for the guy with the sign, but I literally had people who are attacking him. I'm like, is that how you live your life? Because normally we don't see that. You know, we're not privy to conversation between two white people about race, but I'm looking, I mean, it was, he got got kicked out of Walmart. I mean, it was, it was, it was this whole thing. And I'm like, you know, wow. Yeah. That's a conversation we're not even privy to. I'm like, is that what's going on? Right. Yeah. So somebody, if 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 a white person is holding a Black Lives Matter in certain communities, um, well, you know, as, as a teacher, you know, to you know, I, there's no excuse for the hate, right? But I, I don't mean to use excuse, but and I don't want to forgive that behavior in any way. 
But the messaging, the messaging that they're getting right now, the folks that are yelling at the guy with the sign, the only information they're getting is that is, is not the correct information, right? They believe that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist group. They believe that, that Black Lives Matter is, is trying to burn down the cities. And, and you know, and I know, and the guy holding the sign knows that Black Lives Matter is, is uh, people asking for respect and equality. Well, right. it's, a logical, it's a logical reason. Yeah. It's the same people that will argue, oh, it's a terrorist group. I'm like, we had, during the time of Colin Kaepernick, you know, an FBI report or CIA report, I think it was an FBI report, yeah. that tried to frame this whole idea of black identity extremism. Yeah. Which really had to do with how people, how black people expressed the, the, the political dissent or protested. Mm -hmm. and this is interesting when you're talking about it now because we start look at federal troops going over here, over here. Yeah, it was that document, um, and there was n people have been protesting for years. Right, who were the black identity extremists, if you will? And ironically, yeah, you had some. You probably had some black people on, but you probably had just as many white people on that line too. Right, the redundancy of it because right. when you start, you know, when you really start thinking about it. Um, I'm getting ready to do a podcast today. Yeah. And, you know, the title is uh, The Problem of Man Babies in Leadership Positions. Yeah. <laughs> and I call these people man babies. Yeah. Like you're a man, but you're really a baby. Yeah. And when you start thinking about the, the process of a baby, the process of a baby is a baby, you know, comes out of womb. Everything has to be done for the baby. So it's a very egotistical, self centered, until they learn how to engage creation, the environments, and all that stuff. And then you grow up. <clears throat> you know, if you if you have, you know, you have kids, you know, you'll watch your child do something and they'll go, look what I did. Look what I did. Uh, if they put blocks together, it's not that somebody made the blocks. Look what I did with the blocks. And right. you acknowledge that. But what happens when they get older, you know, the, the problem with man babies is they never grow out of that. Right. So it's always about look what I did, look what I did, to total, uh, to total. We're going to totally ignore the realities around us, and the only thing that a man baby could do to stay in the space is I got to be around more man babies. Yeah, I have to be around more guys. You know, this, I remember watching the Flintstones, and I always tried to figure out what was the magic of the water buffalo lodge. You know? Oh, it's where that where. where <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was like the. That's where they could be. That's where they could be man babies. You know, they could be man babies, right? They 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 were just man babies. That's interesting. I'm like it's 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 okay, but when you you can acknowledge that, like I'm yeah, going yeah. to list a little bit, but when that becomes the overall disposition, that becomes the overall expression. That's the average expression. That's the thing that you see first. That's when it becomes problematic. Yeah. So even, you know, in the music business, music business has changed over the years because you have people in positions that had this man baby uh, disposition whereby, you know what, we, we can't make money with acoustic guitarists. We can't make people make money. If they do it, they need to make songs like X, Y, and Z. Sure. And, you know, and the funny part is, well, not the funny part, but the real part of it is there's a space whereby it's so damaging that it cuts off all kind of creativity. You literally right. would discourage people from being creative. Because <clears throat> we're, asking, we're asking somebody to create something that's already been done, right? Right. But now I have to discover it. Look what I did. Look know? what I did. Look what I um, did. What, how, uh, if you were given the opportunity to be in front of the Walmart crowd, and I don't mean to disparage Walmart in any way in this conversation, right? If you had an opportunity as a teacher to, 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 to put yourself in front of the community of folks who are yelling at that one protester, um, how could we uh, have an effective conversation uh, from the stage with a crowd of people who is already mad? Well, this is something I learned from my students. Yeah. We'll disrespect you more <clears throat> if you don't stand on what you believe. Mm -hmm. Part of that anger, see, yeah. the anger's not going to go anyplace. Yeah. You know, uh, it can't get any higher, it can't get any wider. 
But at this point, the anger that we're having, we want to see if it moves the meter on what you believe. Is it palatable enough to make you back off of what you believe, your core values? You know, part of anger a lot of times, in between people a lot of times, if folks don't want to recognize or respect other people's core values. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of my scholars uh, I respect, Dr. Sherman Jackson, said something about the scholars in the past, uh, Islamic scholars. He said that those scholars woke up with the idea that as much as I know in terms of education, religious knowledge, that's how much I don't know. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the argument is I can be right with the possibility of being wrong, right? Mm -hmm. You can be wrong with the possibility of being right. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about Walmart, Black Lives Matter for some people, <clears throat> that changes now to, for me to be right, you have to be wrong. And I can't be halfway right. I have to be absolutely right, and you have to be absolutely wrong. There's no variance in terms of I could possibly get it wrong or a space. And when you say, for me to be right, you have to be wrong, it means that I can't take in any other information. I can't listen to anything you're saying. I'm not going to read. I'm going to listen to the people who inform my position. Right. Even though my position is not a world position, it's a local position. It's a community position. And I've already made the decision and I'm only going to- I have to make sure that people are around me to engage. So when I turn left and right, these are people, for lack of a better word, at the Water Buffalo Lounge. <laughs> right. I know, but how can we, I mean, what's the opening line to the folks that are right on, on, on every side, right? And, and that, I think the word that's being, that, that's being, the phrase that's being used is cancel culture. Like if I already know that I'm right and you already know that you're right, then there's no need for a conversation. Let's cancel the conversation, right? I'm, you're, you're not my friend on Facebook anymore. I'm not your friend on Facebook anymore. We don't have to talk to each other because you don't support my views. I don't, you know what I mean? Like that, how, how I mean, what is, well, without going without going and knocking on the door right yeah, they're, they're not yeah. following they're not following my posts on facebook can i go to that community and knock on the door and say like, hey can we sit down and have a conversation well, right? it, was done, it was done before yeah you know in the in the 50s 40s you know, yeah. slavery was cancel culture okay you know jim crow segregation was cancel culture <clears throat> what we need now is we need compassion culture mm -hmm. we need mercy culture Mm -hmm. And I may walk in front of a group of people who may be hostile. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you know me, man. I, I did, you know, I performed at a lot of colleges and some places. I can't remember the, Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the only thing black was like me and my shadow. And, right. uh, but I had the conviction understanding that whatever you think of me, I think you're worthy of compassion. Disagree, not agree. I think you're worthy of compassion. And that's where I began the argument. You know, mm -hmm. the argument was about compassion. It wasn't about canceling. Yeah. And what you have was, because you always walked up to a cold audience, you did too, and you you threw down, you made your case and you justified your case. And I'm not trying to uh, disrespect you, da, 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 but I'm not trying to be disrespected at the same time. Mm -hmm. so even if I walk out of here and we don't agree, you're going to respect me as a man. You're going to respect me as an artist. Mm -hmm. And that compassion culture is an amazing thing because that we just, you know, uh, may Allah be pleased with them. You know, John Lewis just passed away. 80 years old. I mean, what do you say? Getting good trouble. Mm -hmm. But his good trouble strategically was like, if they have no compassion for us, we have to have even more compassion. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that because cancel culture is it's quick, like you said. It's, yeah, it's quick. You know, I yeah. I haven't really experienced it because um, I, I try not to be in those type of spaces. <laughs> yeah, but it's also that you may not know that somebody will just unfriend you, right? And you know what? But but look at but look how yeah look how how superficial that is. I'm not it's gonna follow you. Right. I'm friendly. you, right. dude. I'm 53 years old. Yeah, you know, I remember. <clears throat> An older guy, maybe like 73 years old, his, his English, I think he was from overseas. Yeah. You know, all he could get right was, you follow me. Right. <laughs> you follow me. I'm like, follow you, follow me, follow me. I'm like, dude, 
he was trying to say follow him on uh, Instagram, but I'm like, we're not from that culture, man. I'm yeah. not from the culture. It's like social media is great, but social media is damaging because it's, mm-hmm. it's social media is not societal understanding. It, I agree. I agree. I, I also think though that you're you're using it as an extension of you. Right, as, as an extension of, of your messaging and what you stand for and what you believe in. It's, it's a place where you can share your thoughts. I mean, you've got, you're using media to share your message in your podcasts and your shows. And, and so well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the sad parts about it is that all that wonderful, compassionate knowledge and teaching we just got to get it to the right audience who's not watching it, right? Well, I mean that you're you're 100 percent right, um, and I think the other thing is <clears throat> there's a there's a space whereby when you talk about compassion culture and things like that, you threaten people. Mm-hmm. Like there's an inherent I feel threatened people because what I've learned about compassion culture is you're really talking about what are your core values? Yeah. Yeah, well, no, when I talk about racism, people go, racism, racism, racism. I say, no, 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 no. Let's break it down. Where does it come from? I say, racism comes from oppression. What are the three things that can, you know, what are the three things that can jail oppression, which are arrogance, envy, and iniquity? Has nothing to do with color, has nothing to do with financials, has nothing to do with your, your gender preference. Arrogance, envy, and iniquity. I'm speaking directly to your core values. Mm-hmm. And on that, you have to stand. So if you're going to tell me uh, Black Lives Matter, that doesn't matter, blah, 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 then I want to hear from your core values. Don't want to hear from your anger. I don't want to hear from the man, man baby stage. Yeah. Or a female baby stage. I want to hear from that part of you that's giving me this feeling right here, right now. And what you find is a lot of times when you're on stage, that breaks in people. Like that breaks in people. I was like, I'm going to show it was affecting you in your own life. When I wasn't around, I'm going to tell you what happened in your life or a scenario. When I wasn't around, I wasn't there. And that's compassion. You learn, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things, Jason, is when I when I taught all those years, uh, they never they never emphasized us to teach the kids about race which is one of the biggest things they're going to deal with in their life. Inner city schools, they're not taught about race. They come to school and experience race or racism, but they're not taught about it. There's not a curriculum that says today we're going to talk about history in this particular context. We're going to talk about government in this particular context. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship in this particular context. And it doesn't happen. We give them the, the lower rungs of uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but it's not in conjunction with anything. It's not yeah. applicable. Right. So even, you know, we talk about diversity. One of the problems with diversity is nobody really knows what it is. There's levels to diversity. Are you talking about in the workplace? Are you talking about race identity politics? Are you talking about mm-hmm. quality conversation? Are you talking about mm-hmm. liberation talk? What are we... Mm-hmm talking about because in that case diversity is inclusive of everybody so you know but it's 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 geared towards minorities Mm -hmm. but minorities who really don't know that you still have to deal with the general public Mm -hmm. i've got to talk to you about this conversation and we find some commonality in it then it's really diverse because diversity is no good unless it's education Mm -hmm. you know you have to move that meter on education. That's why I always, you know, I, I say comedy, I say lecture, because I was always in between. Yeah, yeah. And you want to walk the balance, you know, one has to balance the other, but even with the shout out show. Yeah. I had a guy, uh, he was tuning in from uh, Amon Jordan. <laughs> this is how compassionate this guy. He goes, I'm sorry I couldn't make, I'm sorry I couldn't. Watch your show yesterday. I was driving a cab. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming today. Right. Be careful. Yeah. I hope you're not trying to drive and watch the show. Right. <laughs> With customers in the back. Hey, when you're in the first in the first 
it, you know, we, we're walking on stage for the first time in a cold crowd, you know, there are many layers to preacher moss, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a man, you're black, you're Muslim, you're a dad, like all these layers, how much do you reveal? And I'm trying to think about this. The more we know about somebody, the more, the more we're uh, aware of, of them as, as, as more interesting and amazing beings on this planet, interesting humans, right? When you walk out on stage, or I guess what I'm saying is like, how can we all, and this is almost impossible, like it's a tough question, I'm, I'm, I'm mulling around. How much, can, how much can we reveal, or how much do you reveal in the first five minutes just to let people know everything about you? Or do you save stuff? I reveal it in parts. I, yeah. I, take, um, I, I take a copycat position uh, from uh, prophetic tradition and uh, Abrahamic religions, uh -huh. whereby you are uh, in your, not, not literally, but in your format, you're a messenger. You give warnings and you give glad tidings. And mm -hmm. giving glad tidings allows for you to give the warning. Because if done correctly, the warning actually becomes a glad tiding. People are thankful that they now have this information. I may say this is a dangerous thing, but then I tell you why. And then you go, hmm, that's that's helpful. That's 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 useful for me. Yeah. And so you go you go back and forth with yeah. that. And also the thing is I, I try and make sure the audience knows that they're the ones who are important. You're not here for me, I'm here for you. Yeah. And that was the way it was with teaching. I literally walked in to the classroom one day. I was like, I just want you guys to know, uh, I'm not important. Let's get to work. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. I mean, your perspective there, um, we, we share the same philosophy. The stage was not built for the performer. The stage was built so the audience could see the performer. The yeah. microphone was not created for the performer. The microphone was created so that the audience could hear the performer. The lights yeah. aren't for the, the, the performer. The, the lights are for the audience. Everything has been created for the audience experience. Like We're given yeah. the platform to serve the audience. We're not my, given... My job is yeah. to... Pull you in as close to the message. Yeah. And then get out of the way. <laughs> That's my job. I'm gonna get you in as close yeah. and then I'll get out of the way. And then at this point in time, the exchange of ideas is your ideas. Yeah. You know, there's this, you know, my <clears throat> my mentor used to say, Hey, listen, the information is free. What you do with it is your own business. If I'm talking to you about music and your ideology of how you want to brand your music or mm -hmm. produce it. That's an organic conversation. Mm -hmm. I can't take the same conversation that you have and I'm gonna go over here to another guy and give you all the prescriptions I gave Jason. Mm -hmm. and it's not a cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. And that is something I've been very, very blessed to do with audiences, to not give them cookie cutter. And the other thing yeah. is yeah, yeah. after after a show, you could tell because after a show, you know, people want clarity. People, could you give me some more information on that? Sure. And they're not doing the interviews. I mean, they're trying to increase the value of their knowledge base. So a lot of times that's what it is. And like I said, I, I'm right with the possibility of being wrong. I'm wrong with the possibility of being right. Yeah, I, I really like that. I like that phrase a lot. I like that phrase a lot. When, when I was thinking about you on stage and you were speaking, I, and I'm still trying to get this seeing beyond the, the initial, the first impression. Right. If we could all walk around with the list of things that make us interesting, like on a T-shirt, like not only can you see me for who I am, but these are all the things that I've like been through in my life. And like it's, it's impossible to know that much about your audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe maybe the future is that Google Glasses are going to let me know, like when, when my Google Glasses go to you, it gives me all the lists of all the cool things that make you human so that I see way be beyond what I just see. Like now I'm just now I'm just now I'm just brainstorming on. You know, I'm coming up with a new product. I'm coming up with a new product to bring people together, to see to see deeper into each other's. Uh... You have to take a you have to take a humility pill. All right. You got to take uh, uh, two milligrams or five milligrams of uh, humility pills. And I learned that from you know my my first class I ever taught. Yeah. And I realized that the teachers that they dealt with, the system that they had dealt with never humbled themselves. They treated them like they were kids that were problematic. They came from problematic backgrounds. A lot of the parents 
had gone through the system and, and endured the same thing. You know, I had a um, I had a sixth grade teacher. Everybody has their favorite teacher. My sixth grade teachers scared the hell out of me. <clears throat> Her name was uh, Miss Alveda Jones. And in the sixth grade, I thought she was the meanest woman God had created and put on the world, put on put on earth. You know what I mean? Like in fifth grade, you get your report card to find out who your teacher's gonna be yeah. next year. Um, me and my play brother Rick, it was Miss Alveda Jones. And we literally got emotional about the cry in the schoolyard, knowing our summer was ruined, knowing we had Miss Alveda Jones. Right. And uh, I remember she walked in the room, she made everybody stand up. She gives this picture perfect uh, introduction. Good morning, my name is Miss Alveda Jones. I'm gonna be your teacher for sixth grade. Let me explain something to you. She goes, uh, I am your teacher. I'm not here to be your buddy or friend. I do not have 11 or 12 year old friends. Sit down, shut up. <laughs> and we realized, I realized later when we could be friends uh, after I graduated high school. Yeah. That she said, you know, I'm so focused on the mission of you young men and young women being educated walking out of this classroom. She said, nothing else matters. If you like me or you don't like me, she goes, that's not the mission. And she came out of the old black teachers college. Yeah, yeah. So she's like coming from a whole nother attitude. You know, I'm talking about a whole different orientation. Yeah. I'm like, this woman is giving me history. Uh -huh. I'm trying to give her the blues in class. She's giving me history. She's going, this is the blueprint that you need to follow. Everything else will fall into place. But for right here, yeah. this is what I need you to do. Mr. Moss, Mr. Sklaffick, this is what I need you to do. Brother Jason, this is what I need you to do. Let me give you this information. At least let me give you the information. You can do what you want to afterwards. Yeah. But I have to give it to you in this particular form. Mm -hmm. You have to receive it. Because she led us into spaces where we must be critical thinkers. I mean, you do workshops and things like that. You know, one of your outcomes obviously is we're going to improve or facilitate critical thinking. <clears throat> and here we are in the sixth grade, you know, little knuckleheads, but she's putting that in us in the sixth grade. I mean, by the time I hit the 12th grade, man, I was, that was my favorite teacher. And yeah. I, I had the opportunity to go back and tell her. Uh, but I mean, to your point about cancel culture. Yeah. It's an education now. Mm -hmm. That's an education. We're, we're, we're going to see cancel culture here uh, fairly soon with kids being ordered to go back to school. The school's reopening. And the cancel culture is going to be on teachers. Because now it's like, oh, if you don't go in and teach, you're not doing your patriotic duty. Well, living is a patriotic duty. Good health is a patriotic duty. Protecting my family. Yeah, right. What are we saying? For me to be right, you must be wrong. For you to be wrong, I must be right. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you create these arguments, and those are more the arguments that we're having. And that, that you got to take those, you know, those, yeah. those uh, two pills, those two humility pills, to be able to see a lot. You know, um, I used to be very myopic. Yeah. You know, talk about race and things like that. Till I started going out on the road, man, and wind up in these spaces in Tennessee and, 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 yeah. uh, West Virginia and, and uh, you know, down south. Yeah. And you saw the suffering. Yeah, you saw black suffering, but I saw white suffering. Mm -hmm. I saw whites that weren't doing so good. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember, uh, remember, have you ever done Aurora College? There's one in Illinois. Yeah, yeah, Aurora College down in the Quad Cities area, Moline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I did a show there for the orientation. Yeah. And uh, I was pulling out, like on Saturday, I was going to head back up to, uh, I think it was Milwaukee. Yeah. And uh, I was looking for a bank because I wanted to deposit my check. I don't like to travel. But I'm leaving the hotel, and I get a little lost, and I see this line of people. Yeah. Like a long line of people. And uh, it's mostly, you know, mostly white people, a couple of Latinos, maybe one or two blacks. But it's mostly, yeah. and I'm thinking, man, what the, you know, what are they giving away? You know, what are they giving away? What's on sale, you know? Yeah. And I followed the line, man. Brother, there's a food pantry. Mm -hmm. This was not during COVID. 
This is yeah. not even the, uh, the the Great Recession, the housing crash. Yeah. This was a regular Saturday, man. Mm -hmm. And it put it in your heart, like people are suffering. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we you know we have cancel culture. You know, we don't have we don't have suffering. Uh, we don't cancel suffering. <laughs> you we let that keep going. Yeah, we don't have a cancel suffering culture. Right. Yeah. So it's like when you start looking at it and and, and trying to line it up effectively. It's like, man, there's so much work to do. Yeah. There's so much work to do. And right. a lot of times, you know, we have to look at who our enemies are. Who how, are do you, how, how do you overcome the overwhelm of your compassion, right? Because you, you're you noticing all these things, right? How do you not pick and choose, but how do you manage the overwhelm of all the possibilities of the good you can do in the world, right? Well... It's about intentionality. Mm -hmm. you know, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say there's a, a good side to uh, opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. Can't be everywhere at every time. You you mm -hmm. can't affect. That's not your job. You know, yeah. your job is to. My job, as a Muslim, is to serve creation. Mm -hmm. That says, it's a wide thing. Serve creation. Creation is everywhere. I'm in a space where. I can recognize where it is. So we have this idea, this, uh, mm. you know, how we acquire knowledge about creation is a space whereby we attach meaning to it. And so I can go over here and it doesn't have to be big. And you know, I can donate money over here. I could do a benefit over here, but I can talk to a kid that's not having a good day. Mm -hmm. have to be his dad or his friend or mm -hmm. something like that. Or, you know, I can, you know, help a, elderly lady just trying to get her groceries out. Yeah. It's, yeah, all yeah. About, it's so much about intention. Mm -hmm. And more so, it's not about showy, showy efforts of charity. Quiet. Just really quiet. Like, you know, a lady was like one time, you know, she wanted, Yeah. I want to give you, man, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to keep it moving. I don't, I don't want to disrespect you. Yeah, I I just want to keep it moving. And and it's like that. And you have people like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. man, we just want to keep this thing moving. Let me get on to the next thing I could be doing that's a positive or has positive. Right. I, I love that quiet efforts of charity. Right. So you're not you're not doing it to post about it or to tell everyone about it or to be on the donor list. Right. <laughs> you're, you're be doing, on the donor list. I love it. Yeah, you're doing it because um you're doing what you can, where you can, where it fits you as a human, and and you're at your your moving creation. I have you're, a spiritual you're, you're, yeah. responsibility. Yeah, and at the same time, you're taking a humility pill, right? Because yeah. and we all, as we all should, so that we, in order for you to be right, you're I have to be wrong, right? That, I love that that idea to take like. It's amazing how much we learn as we live through life, right? How, you know, and how much we knew uh, when we took, I, I was a student teacher too, right? I was, a, I did 11th and 12th grade English, right? You know, so um, I went into that very cocky, you know? And it's, it's really, I, 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 hey, I've learned a lot from you today. <laughs> Likewise, and um, I, I love the idea of the humility pill. Take a humility pill. I, I, I really, um, I want to sit with. For me to be right, you have to be wrong. I've got members of my family that I want to have that conversation with. Um, I have a, quiet I have a efforts of charity. I have, a, I have a heartbreaking story. Oh, do you? I live this story every Ramadan. Okay. But I was a young Muslim going through one of my first Ramadans. And I didn't really know the whole scope of fasting. I just knew at sundown you can eat and drink. Yeah. It was actually in Milwaukee. And uh, there I was in Milwaukee. And I'm literally in line trying to get my food as the sun goes down. I've been starving all day. It's nothing spiritual. I'm just starving. You know, I'm not kidding. So um, somewhere along the line, I get an attitude that the line's not moving fast enough these people i am fasting these people and i 
I'm I don't I'm out of my head. I'm, I'm delirious. I haven't eaten. Right. I'm not in my right mind. Okay, and I remember uh, getting really really upset. I walk out of the restaurant. It was on the east side, and uh, I saw a guy foraging for food out of a trash can. And I literally referred to him as not how, hey brother, how are you? I was like, hey bum. And he didn't respond, like, hey bum, bum. And he looked up, like, hey bum, what are you doing? And I'm, I, of course, I'm in this attitude thing. I'm like, look bum, today you're not gonna eat out of a trash can. I was like, here's 10 bucks, something like that. It was 10 or 20 bucks. Yeah. Go get yourself some food, don't eat the trash can today. And I give him the greeting half-heartedly, uh, almost like disrespectfully. I'm like, you know, the greeting is "Assalamu alaikum," yeah, uh, which is peace man to you. And I just flat out "Assalamu alaikum" like that. And I turn around and walk, and I get to the part of the alley, and I hear "Walaikum assalam." I was like, oh my god, I think I've disrespected a Muslim that was hungry eating out of the trash can. I was like, what kind of person am I? <laughs> Like what kind of person? Jason, I'm here to tell you, brother. I sat on a curb mm -hmm. and I cried like a newborn. I cried like a newborn. That guy had to come over and console me. Mm -hmm. and I, I apologized profusely. And I said, because I'm not that guy. I, I'm, I'm lost. I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. No humility pills. We're talking mm -hmm. about humility pills. He hadn't eaten. I fasted that day. Yeah. Had a choice. He's eating out of trash can. He doesn't have a choice. Yeah. And I remember that story vividly, man, because, sure. you know, that that's the balance. You know, that's the beauty and the ugliness of who we could be mm -hmm. at any given time. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you, you get in those spaces like, wow, man, this is really, you know, you really have to watch what you say and you have to make sure emotionally and spiritually that you're centered when you talk to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're not on the, hey, bum, throwing money at them. Mm -hmm. You say peace man to you. It's a greeting of the angels. You just don't throw it out there like some some hashtag, you know. And right. uh, it's you know something that's so you didn't no, you don't take something that's so personal and just make it so impersonal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that man. So yeah, brother. I, yeah, thank you for actually you reminded me of that story. No, thanks for sharing. Not, story. not taking those humility pills, man. <laughs> it's a pain. No, that's a really that's a that. But that I mean. You, in your sharing of that story, hopefully for anybody who listens to our conversation, will be able to look at their own life and say that it's, and know that it's okay to have those moments when we learn, right? Yeah. And to not, and to know that they're still gonna happen. We're still gonna have moments when we're, we're tired, we're cranky, and we're not the person who we wanna be. And we're gonna fail. Right, yeah. And we're gonna fail. Yeah, yeah. And and to and to then and to then move forward and continue to 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 add to the creation, right? To to support the good in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, like Al Jiro, um, who makes great connections with his audiences, as you do, um, I, I'd like to sing a song with you. Which one um, is that? Morning, Mr. Radio. A morning, little cheerio. A morning, sister, don't you know that, 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 that everything is just fine? Did it yeah. did, in my mind? In my mind. Man, is that a killer? That's a great song. We should drive to school with that song on. Yeah. Excuse me if I sing. My heart has found its wings. Georgina, I know. Oh man, you kidding me? Ah, that joint. Yeah. Ricky, we got by. You ever heard him sing? We got by. Yeah, sing it to me. I can't. I, can't, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to disrespect. No, Al Jiro has just. I mean, when you mentioned it earlier, I was like, oh, I love Al Jiro. I really do. I mean, I was a. You know, I, I, as a comedian, I grew up around jazz musicians. Yeah. So learning comedic phrasing was not like writing a joke. It was yeah. music. Yeah. Like we literally had a meeting yesterday and the guy was like, I was pitching a guy that's pitching something to a network. Yeah. And uh, he was like, how'd you write this? And I just blurred out, oh, this is Frank Morgan's tune, uh, Old Bowl New Grits. And he's like, what? <laughs> I was like, I wrote it to Old Bowl New Grits and I forgot that he wasn't <laughs> jazz. Right, right. right. Like, but this is a great album, trust me. 
I was yeah. like, there's the flow of it. And he was like, oh my gosh. And right. you know what, man? Sometimes we we miss that. So we miss the algeros. We yeah. miss the conversation in music. Mm -hmm. You know, we miss the, the conversation in music, which is a conversation that happens in your house. Mm -hmm. That joy, that exuberance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't talk about that enough. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, I, it's like I have Instagram, you know. To me, Instagram is pictures, not really conversation. It's like I can I can roll up, da da da. I, I have a, you know, I always have a memory of a woman in my mosque in DC. She passed away, she was like 92, 93. May, 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 may Allah be pleased with her. But whenever I would come off the road and I come in for prayers, I would have to sit and listen to her for like five minutes. And she would always sell me something. And she, she hey, hey, come and sit down. And she would ask how I was doing, ask how my family was doing. Uh, she'd say a little prayer for me. And then I buy a trinket for like two dollars. Mm -hmm. you know? And I remember when I wasn't there, she took ill. It was like we, 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 the mosque raised money to buy all her trinkets. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so when she comes back, she didn't have to worry about selling something. We bought it all. Right. And it was just that we loved you. That was all it was. It's like we yeah. loved. You. I told her that. So you know, for all those years, imagine someone does that to you for uh, almost thirty years. Almost it doesn't matter what you do, you can be a big star. You can be. Wouldn't it be wonderful to just be able to go around the world and and just to, to like just I want to buy your trinkets so you can be done with selling trinkets. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, yes. I, I'm gonna I I buy a lottery ticket so that I can buy your trinkets. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so oh, man, that's philanthropy. <laughs> but you know, Jason, that's 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 you. I can see you riding down a neighborhood. So I'm riding down some some neighborhood, and some kid has lemonade sitting out there. And you'll stop your car and you'll get out and you'll buy three or four cups of lemonade. And so the kid really feels good. You drink them all in front of the kid. Get back in your in, in your car. <laughs> Have to go to a, go to a gas station around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Belly full of lemonade. <laughs> I, I'm that dude, man. I'll I'll stop at a yeah a really good barbecue. I can smell it. I'll, I pull the car around. And, I mean, I don't eat any. Uh, I don't eat pork, but uh, good chicken barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue chicken. Yeah. And the funny part is, you're gonna have a conversation. Yeah. For, for all, all the West Indian people watching this. Yeah. You know you can't have food without a conversation. <laughs> you can give your order. Yeah. You're gonna talk about yourself to the cook. It's almost like I gotta qualify myself to the cook. To make sure my right. Food is right. Right. Don't be rude because you'll get an order, but it won't be made with love, man. <laughs> There's no compassion yeah. in that jerk chicken. Yeah. Oh, you got me thinking. There's a farmer's market here with a with a Jamaican um, restaurant. You know what I'm talking about. You already got me thinking about food, and it's still morning. It's all good, man. It's all good. You be thinking about food all the time, man. Just, I do think about food. Just, I not, it's just not eating it. You I know? think about food all the time. I'm like, yeah. I to eat it. I'm like, just the conversations and the... The well, person the, around we, food. Huh? I, I think we're I think we're both very lucky that we got we get to travel a lot and we got to we get to experience different local flavors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm a big guy with that man. Yeah, it's like certain things, man. Certain certain things you grow up with. You know, when you're a kid and you're like a beginning musician, beginning comedian, you travel down south. You know that your budget has to have an allotment of money for Waffle House. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a Waffle House budget. <laughs> you gotta have. You know, back in the day, man, you go to Waffle House. Uh, do, you a, do, you a go -to, like, do you have a go-to Waffle House order? I have a go-to Waffle House order. I don't. Do you have a? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a menu? Absolutely not. <laughs> I want this. I want this. Right, Both right. Done, lingo. The funny part is, uh, you. Um, I appreciate Waffle House because it's always been affordable. Yeah. Like Twenty. Like for twenty bucks, you could feed half the population in Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> it get changed. <laughs> it <should> change. <laughs> it's funny, man. It's so true. I've made the Waffle House like this. Um, this th with my kids. Like I was like, yeah, someday we'll get to go to Waffle House. Like I've made it the uh, 
like the best place to go. And we've done it a couple of times in the last five years. So like, all right, I picked you up early from school because it's a teacher work day, really special day. We're going to Waffle House. Like, and, and, and <laughs> I'm not kidding. My children, my children think the Waffle House is like a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. So <laughs> that's and my- keep, And keep it that way. I know, right? <laughs> oh, keep that way. <laughs> I am, man. I get the cheesy scramble with the raisin toast. That's my go-to. I love it. I get it. I get a four egg scramble with cheese. Yeah. Um, I get the I get the grits, mm -hmm. and I get the raisin toast. And that is a, that's a winner, man. I don't think I eat the rest of the day or until the next morning. I'm just no, hungry. you don't need to. You don't need you know to. You know why? It's not that you're not hungry. You just don't want to be disappointed after eating Waffle House. You don't want your next meal. There's no way to compare. You need 24 hours to get that out of the system. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hunger without recollection. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta reflect for at least twenty four hours on your Waffle House meal. That's brilliant. It's like you're, if you're married, you know, take your wife to the Waffle House. Don't go by yourself, and then let her cook for you. That's gonna be a fight. <laughs> oh yeah, you can't compare. It's like get your stuff. You're going too. Disappointing. Oh man. So have fun today with the shout out show and the man yes, babies sir. episode. So what's cool is about that, that'll be available. The shout out show exists so we can go back and watch previous episodes, right? I do have a YouTube channel Yep. Uh, by accident because I guess uh -huh. YouTube takes all the content. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, this is, in fact, you know, keep us, keep us, everybody keep us in your prayers, man. I'm, uh, this Saturday be the 100th episode of the shout out show. That's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, man. We're blessed, man. We started yeah. April the 24th and never stopped. Started the first day of Ramadan and never stopped. No so kidding. Seven days a week. Right. Congrats. I am the, uh, I'm the, uh, I'm the Muslim Waffle House, brother. You are the Muslim Waffle House. <laughs> the Muslim Waffle House are the online shows. They... <laughs> I'm gonna, that's going to be the title of your talk today. <laughs> Muslim Waffle House. Yeah. Uh, Peach, it's good talking to you. Likewise, man. Continue Thanks. success, Jason. Stay in touch. Yes, Have sir. a great day. All right. Stay blessed, man. Bye. Bye.